document consists of five parts, and we've talked about the first four, all right, in which you define what the site is going to be about, define three personas, which are meant to be representative users, and define three goals for each of them, as well as goals for the organization. So the first part, the strategy part, is all about what you hope to achieve by your website and what your visitors hope to achieve by visiting your website. Again, they need to be getting something out of it too. So you want to uh, achieve something, and that's why you're creating the website. Uh, but by the same token, they want to achieve something as well. So you document that. You document what you expect your visitors are going to be wanting out of the site, as well as what you want out of the site. That's the goals. The second step is, or the second piece is the scope section. And that's where you write requirements. And what requirements are, are statements uh, about specific content that's going to be on the site. So the site will have our brunch menu uh, on it, if we're doing a website about a restaurant, for example. Um, the site will have, will feature the weekly specials. The site will feature uh, billing information for our catering service, and so on. These requirements tie closely with the goals. This is the way you're trying to achieve those goals. You define what you want to achieve, then you define the things that you're going to put on the site that's going to help you achieve that. And that's the scope section. The third section is the structure section where you say how the pages are going to be split up. Because you could split up pages a whole bunch of different ways. You could put everything on one web page. Or you could break it down into a bunch of web pages. Well, you want to decide what the best way is and how to have those pages connected. And that is the structure section. And you'll draw a chart, like an organization chart, that says this is a home page. Off of that home page are these four pages. Maybe another page has a couple pages off of it. Fourth thing is a skeleton, where a skeleton is um, a description of the layout where you um, say in, in big chunks how the page is going to be laid out. You don't go into great detail, but you say over the top of the page there's going to be a banner. Going down the side of the page is going to be a navigation. We're going to have uh, our main section over here. On the bottom of the page you're going to have a footer, and then maybe over here we have some additional information. So you actually sketch it out in, with big blocks. So sometimes these are called wireframes. Then you create the prototype. All right. Does anyone know what, the, what a prototype is? How would you define the word prototype? It's a rough draft. That's one good way to look at it. Another way to describe it? A test? Pardon me? Maybe not quite up to beta yet. Beta is usually when things are pretty functional, whereas a prototype doesn't really need to be completely functional. It, it may even be before that. Uh, it could be an alpha version, uh, or it could even be before that. I would say a model, all right, would be another way to look at it. Especially if you think, like, if we're just talking about the word prototype, like in manufacturing, if they say we're going to make a prototype of the new iPhone. Well, they're going to make a model of the new iPhone that may or may not do the things that it's supposed to do, but at least will give people the idea. And the idea of a prototype is that despite our attempts to document it in writing, people really respond best to actually seeing the thing in question and putting their hands on it and trying it out. That's where people generally uh, can respond to it and can offer good feedback. So I could describe how the web page is going to look, what's going to, be, uh, what's going to be on the website, what's going to be the basic layout, and so on. But really what connects with people is if you actually have an example of the website. 
All right? Now, a prototype doesn't have to be finished or complete or completely correct in order to be effective. It just needs to be complete enough to give the people an idea of what the final website is going to look like. All right? So that's what you're going to turn in for your design document. Something that is partly complete, but not necessarily totally complete. There's a little bit of a dilemma when you're developing a prototype. Because when you develop a prototype, you're actually developing it in order to be criticized. All right? You want people to look at it and say, no, this is what I want you to do. I want you to change this around. And I want the stuff that you have over here, I want it to be over there. And that color red is too bright. I want a, want a, a, a darker color of red. And I don't like that font, and so on. The reason for that is when you get people commenting on it, all right, and by people, I mean typically the people that you're developing the site for. You know, if you're developing the site, maybe the organization you're developing the site for. If people aren't giving feedback, sometimes you wonder if they're actually looking at it closely enough. All right? Uh, so therefore, you want people to give feedback. In a way, you have to develop a little bit of a thick skin when you present a prototype. All right? Because you're building something to present to them in order to get comments and criticism. So if they criticize something, if they don't like your design, and they say, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like that, that's OK, because this isn't the final version of it. And their criticisms will give you an idea of what you need to do for the final version of it. So it gets you to that information that you need for them criticizing it. So sometimes, you know, if, uh, if the user doesn't give you a lot of information about what they want the site to look like, you just have to make up something and take a shot. And they might shoot it down. In fact, in that case, they, they're likely to shoot it down if they didn't give you any information. Don't take it as an attack if they criticize it, all right? Because you're getting the information you need to complete the task and to uh, do a good job on it, all right? The dilemma in a prototype is you want it to be complete enough so that people look at it and get an idea of what the finished product is going to look like. But you don't necessarily want to spend so much time on it to polish it and to make it perfect. All right? Because you know that they're likely to criticize it, and they're likely to give you feedback on it, and you're going to have to change stuff anyhow. So you don't want to spend an excessive amount of time developing it, because you're going to probably have to rework parts of it anyhow. All right? You're going to take it and you're going to show it to the people that are called stakeholders, people from the organization that you're developing the site for. And they're going to look at it and they're going to give you feedback. And again, they may be very critical for it, uh, about it, rather. But you don't want to spend, so therefore you want it to look sort of complete. But you don't want it to be so complete that you spent an excessive amount of time on it because you're probably going to have to rework it anyhow. All right, Sort of the bottom line of uh, developing uh, a prototype. All right, You have to take it, again, you have to make sure you don't take it personally. All right, Because they're going to, there is very likely that they're going to criticize it. All right. A prototype doesn't need to be complete. In other words, you don't have to have every single page on your site a prototype developed for. So if your website's going to have eight different pages on it, my suggestion is that you've developed three of them. Develop the home page and develop a couple other ones. And that should be enough to give the user an idea of what the entire site's going to look like. You also don't need to have completed content. 
all right? In other words, uh, maybe you're waiting for them to provide you images. And they said, okay, we'll give you images of our restaurant and our specialties and so on. Well, you might not have those images yet, all right, because they may be, they may be still working on obtaining them. But you can still develop a prototype just by substituting sample images in. And again, be sure that they know that you're doing that, all right? Uh, I remember I developed a prototype, uh, not for a website, but for uh, another kind of computer system. And I just like made up costs for, for automobiles, because this is a car rental company. And I just made up some unrealistic data. I just, you know, probably just hit the key two, 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 you know, a bunch of times just to enter a price. And the person looked at it as like, oh, there's no way a car would cost that much or that little. And it's like, I just made up that data. It's not meant to be real data. I just did it so that there were some numbers to show on this report, you know. Um, so let them know that it's not real data. Sometimes you might not have the text completed for a web page, all right? In that case, it's appropriate to use Greek text, all right? Of course, again, you would want to explain to them that this is not the final version of the site. It's not going to look like that, but rather this is just a placeholder for the actual text. Just a chance to see what it is going to look like, all right? The great thing about a prototype, again, is that it's the one way that people actually see as close to the real site as possible before the real site is completed. And therefore, their feedback is, is going to be typically uh, going to be very good and very pointed about that. It is possible, with what we know in CSS, to create a couple of prototypes very easily. Right? We've shown how you can take and I think one of your upcoming assignments is you take a web page and create two versions of it. <coughs> you use the same HTML and apply different CSS to it. So I don't make it a requirement for your project, but that would actually be something good to do in a real case, is come up with a couple versions of it, right? And say, hey, here is option A, here is option B. And as you might imagine, the person might not say, well, I like option A or I like option B, but they might say, you know, I like the color scheme in option A, but I like the fonts in option B. Can you combine them? And of course you can. And the nice thing is, is if you've used good strategies in developing your code, that should be very easy to develop multiple prototypes for and to change the CSS simply by having everything in a single CSS file and making changes that way. Any questions about a prototype? So develop three pages. Actually develop the HTML, the CSS. So you have three HTML pages, probably only one CSS page, all right? Because again, you want your pages to look consistent along with whatever images or anything else goes. And that is the final part of your design. So four written parts in a Word document plus a prototype that consists of HTML pages. Questions about that? All right. Um, I, I want to spend a little bit of time now talking about your portfolio, because the first draft of the portfolio is, is due. Um, can anyone define what a portfolio is? Yeah, it's a really good definition, a collection of the work that you've done. It could be during a class, or it could be through, throughout your whole career, depending on the nature of it. Uh, portfolios can have different uses, depending on uh, whether they're done for a class or whether they're done professionally. Designers, for example, graphic designers and web developers will have a portfolio of the projects that they've worked on. Uh, design companies will have that too. Because what better way to evaluate uh, a prospective employee or a company than by looking at their previous work? Let's say I wanted to hire a web developer. I might go and look at their portfolio. Yes? 
absolutely. Uh, as a web developer, uh, it doesn't cost a lot to have a website. You know, you could go on GoDaddy and like five dollars a month, I think. Doesn't cost much, must much to register a domain name. And you can create and you can put up a website and you can put work that you've done in class uh, and outside of class and, and collect it together on a portfolio that you can show it. I will share with you something that employers often tell me, all right, is they often tell me what gives a, a student an edge is when people, when, when students come in and they can show work that they've done outside of the classroom, all right? Um, so therefore, if you can show that you have a portfolio that wasn't required by any class, but you just developed a portfolio to market yourself and to show your skills and all that. That's something no one told you you had to do. All right. Now again, we're doing that for this class, but if you were to create a bigger portfolio that included all your work, that's not something you have to do. You took the time to develop it outside of class and to maintain it and so on. That shows that you really have an interest and a passion for the field and are willing to go the extra yard. Also, to develop a website for a nonprofit organization, a club, a family business, whatever, even if it's a small website, if you can do that and make it go live, that's a great opportunity for you to, again, to document the work that you've done and to show that you're not just the person that just wants to do the absolute minimum to get by in class and you don't have really an interest or passion. So I'd encourage you all to create a portfolio that you maintain after this class. Now a portfolio that you do for marketing is going to be a little different than a portfolio that you do inside a class for education. They have different purposes, right? The portfolio that you do in this class, the purpose of it is to give you an opportunity to sort of reflect back on your learning, to think about the stuff that you've learned, to think about maybe how you do things differently now that you know more, and so on. So if you're doing a portfolio to market yourself, it's, it might not contain all of your work. All right. In fact, it probably shouldn't contain all of your work. You should pick the few things that you think really highlight your skills and show those. Uh, whereas in a, in a classroom environment, a portfolio is going to be a little more comprehensive. I want you to put all your assignments out there. All right. Let's go and let's look at some portfolios. Let's just Google some portfolios and see some examples of them. Examples of good portfolios. For students, sure. All right, let's go and we can look at some of them. Now again, keep in mind that a portfolio is meant to showcase your skills and show the range of skills that you have. Uh, you can do this in a lot of areas. Uh, one thing about web development, again, is there's a lot of different sort of sub areas that you could go into. And whatever your specialty is or your or skills are, you want to document it. For example, if someone was a graphic designer, maybe they'll show logos that they created for organizations or assignments to create them. If someone is a photographer, you might show examples of photos. And you could show examples of web pages as web developers. Let's look at the best portfolio sites of 2017. That's not that long ago. Raul Goyard. I'm a 
creative developer looking for a full-time position in 2019. This is showing their work with animation and CSS. I personally am not crazy about that because I think you should, I, I'm, think, I'm expecting to be able to click on those and have something happen, but it doesn't. All right? But okay. over here it says, see my work. All right, here's something that they've done. And you can view their website. Interesting. I'm not a huge fan of this portfolio. I think it shows some good things, but I think the navigation is really confusing. Like, how do I get to the next project? Let's look at this one. I don't know if it's because it's a Monday and I, I woke up having some nightmares and some very bad dreams, but I'm not loving any of these portfolios. Okay, here's one. This one I like. See, I'm capable of saying nice things. Because the navigation is clear. Yeah, maybe. I, I say, I, I, I like it though. What I like about this is it's not just a collection of work. The person talks about the work on the side too. That gives you some insight about their thought processes or the context that they did it, and I think that's important too. That's definitely important in the kind of portfolios we're going to do for this class, because I don't want you just to slap together all the web pages. I want you to think about what you've learned, and think about like, okay, I knew this at this point, and I know this now, so if I was redoing this assignment, I would have done such and such. Now again, keep in mind that not all of these are websites because portfolios can be done for a lot of people that do design regardless of the content. Like this, for example, is, is a magazine or a book, a publication. So it's going to look a little different than you would do a portfolio for a website, but again, still the idea is the same. So industrial design. So again, a totally different kind of discipline. You know, Compare any of these, even, even ones I didn't like, <laughs> all right? But compare if you were hiring someone 
and someone just, you know, and you had two candidates, one that just had a paper resume, you know, that looks like every other student's paper resume, all right, and someone had a resume and had a portfolio for you to go and actually review their work, it's clear which one is probably going to have the edge. All right, so I can't encourage you enough not to do, number one, do work outside of the classroom. All right, even if you're to make a fan page about something, you know, you might think that sounds silly, but, you know, hey, that shows that you can, that, that you're committed to this, and it shows that you are willing to do the work and, and so on. All right. Uh, but I, it's, it's pretty, pretty obvious which one would get the edge, the person that has a portfolio. Uh, I will say, being in a position to hire people, when you start getting in resumes for like entry-level positions, they all start to look alike, right? And they all have taken similar classes and have a similar background. And it's really hard to differentiate between two students that are recent grads just on the base, basis of like a standard, typical resume that you're going to get. Therefore, anything you can do to differentiate yourself, internships that you could have, I encourage you all to do work-based learning if you, if you have the opportunity to. All right? Volunteer work that you can do. Uh, developing, like I said, a site for a family business or a club or even a fan page or something. All that kind of stuff will serve to differentiate you from the crowd and will help you get a job. Let's look for an example of simple Now, I'm going to maybe contradict myself, but on a site for business, this sort of scrambling of letters would probably really annoy me. But on a portfolio, it might be OK. Why do you think I say that? Right. But how, why is it okay here? Exactly, because he's showing off his skills. All right. So I would say, yeah, you know, um, something like this, there, there really isn't a good reason to make the letters scramble. All right. But on a portfolio website, that shows that I know enough to make the letters scramble. It does. Right. I, I agree. This is really a good example that shows, in my mind, that good design doesn't have to be complicated or intricate. It's really very simple. And there's a couple little icings on the cake, like those little figures, sort of, um, the little geometric shape sort of floated in after the page loaded. All right, enough about this. What about your assignment? I show these for inspiration, all right? Not that I expect you to do uh, 
this well after your first class in web development. You know, but it's inspiring. It's a way of looking and saying, wow, I hope to uh, aspire to that level and maybe learn something from it on ways that you can differentiate yourself. So let's look at what your assignment is and let's look at an example. Okay, portfolio overview. Portfolio is a collection of your work, blah, 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 blah. You need to keep an example or a copy of each assignment. Uh, I, I, I mentioned this at the beginning of class to review the portfolio. If you have not kept an exam, uh, a copy of your project, you can always download what you've turned in. All right, so you're not totally lost. Let me correct the spelling here. You're going to do two parts of this. You're going to do for the first part of the class, and then you're going to do the second part of the class. So March 14th, which means that you're all very late or all very early. I will correct that. The correct date is in the syllabus. Let's look at that. Ten fourteen. That is couple weeks for today, all right? Or a couple weeks from tomorrow, I think, actually. Or maybe a couple weeks from today. I don't know. In a couple weeks, your first draft of the portfolio is done, is due, all right? And what will it consist of? You'll have a page named Portfolio.html. Put some content about yourself, an explanation of what the page is, and develop this using everything that you've learned about developing good websites. Okay? Everything that we've learned up to this point about what makes a website good, use in creating your portfolio page. Create an external style sheet to format the page. Create a link to each of the pages, labs one through six. If the lab, if the assignment only has, has more than one page, you only need to create a link to one of the pages. And create a link back from each assignment back to the portfolio. Include some notes about each page, what you learned, something you struggled with, what you enjoyed about the assignment, Maybe how you'd do it different if you were doing it now. All right. And anything else you consider relevant. The last part of the portfolio that you're turning at the very end of the semester is essentially the same thing, updated with everything you've known, everything you've learned since then. And you'll enhance it. I want you to add some JavaScript, which we'll get to later on in the class. All right, let's look, because I have an example portfolio. I'll move 
move it into week six here. I only have a couple labs here, all right, but you'll have labs one through six. Notice I've created a, another folder for those labs. That's one thing that we have not done so far in this class, at least I haven't talked about in this class, is so far in this class the assumption has been that everything for a given web page is in the same folder. We're going to change that now. We're going to change that assumption and say, well, what if stuff is in different folders? How, do, how does that work? Here's the portfolio. Notice I don't have a lot of styling on this. All right? You will do a much better job than me, and I'll be proud of you for that. All right? This is just a example of how your portfolio is going to be structured. Don't turn in something like this. It's a great luxury of being a professor is I can from time to time tell you, don't do what I've done, do better than that. And this is an example of that. So where I have the word paragraph, please don't turn in something that has the word paragraph there. You are to write a paragraph about yourself and your experiences in this class. All right? Underneath the examples, you'll have something like this. You'll have a list of your labs, and you'll have notes about each of the labs. For example, lab one, I learned you have to put ending tags. That's something I learned in lab one. Lab two, and so on. Now notice what happens when I click on lab one. I go to the page. And I can click back to the portfolio. So if there's more than one page, which there isn't in this example, but if there was more than one page, I don't have to have the link. I don't have to link to every page in the assignment. Just link to one of the pages, and from the, from that same page have a link back. So you do have to make some slight edits to your existing pages. All right. Now, let's look at how you get to different folders. Notice that each of these has a folder underneath it. Uh, each, each lab has its own folder underneath it, lab one and lab two. From my portfolio home page, if I want to go down a folder, and this applies whether you're talking about links or images or CSS files or anything. If the file that you're interested in is in a folder below the web page, you put the name of the folder and slash and then the name of the web page. If there were two folders, you'd put the name of the folder, a slash, name of the second folder, a slash, and then the name of the web page. Okay? So what this is saying is that this page is not in the same folder as this page, right? It's in a folder underneath it called lab1, and it's called faq.html. So if I go there, there it is. All right? When you're, and how many of you have had CISS 125 yet? OK. For those of you that have, it's very similar to the way that you use on the command line how you move between folders, CD, space. The idea is, though, is if you are going down, there could be multiple folders you're going down to. So from this folder, there's a couple of children folders underneath that. So you have to specify the name of the child folder, slash, and then the file name. If I was doing an image, it would be the same way. Image, 
S, uh, SRC equals images slash file name. Now notice a couple things. Nothing at the beginning. There shouldn't be like some people have turned in C colon slash slash file slash blah 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 blah. Nothing. This is called a relative path. It's based on this file's starting position. So relative to this file's location, to get to this page, all you have to do is go down a folder. So when I, when I go and grade this on my machine, I have totally different folders than you do. As long as everything's in the same relative position, though, it doesn't matter where I put this on my computer, it'll work. As long as I have a subfolder called lab1, all right, it'll work. Notice there's nothing before it. And notice that this is a slash like this, a forward slash, not a backslash. This is the one thing that's a little different than maybe what you had covered in CISS 125. In CISS 125, if you worked on Windows, you used the backslash to separate directories, because that's what Windows does. Even if you are on a Windows machine, if you're doing web development, you always use the forward slash. All right? Always use the forward slash to separate directories. Now, if I'm in the subfolder, oh, I was opening the file within the zip file. That's one thing that, again, notice it says extract. That's inside the zip folder. If you do that, the links and stuff won't work. You have to actually be in the folder after it's been expanded. Correct. Windows term is a zip folder, but you're right. It's actually not a folder. It's actually a single file. If I'm in this file, though, and I want to go up to the parents directory, I don't have to put the name of the parents directory. I only have to put dot dot. So the link from this page to the portfolio home, I don't have to specify the name of the folder. I just say dot dot slash and then the file name. That's because if you're going down to a child folder, a parent folder can have many children folders. But a child folder can only have one parent folder. Therefore, it's not necessary for me to put the name of the parent folder. Dot dot simply means that folder's parent. So dot dot takes me up a folder to the parent. So in this case, if I was in this folder, dot dot would take me to this folder. So if you have all your assignments, great. If you don't, download them from Canvas. Put each one of them in a folder named Lab 1, Lab 2, Lab 3, Lab 4, Lab 5, Lab 6. Create your portfolio page to link to them by putting in the folder name slash file name and create a link back by saying dot dot slash portfolio. It's pretty much what you need to do to make this work. This, by the way, applies any time you have stuff in other folders. Like I said before, if you had an image in a different folder, you'd follow the same rules. If you're going down, you'd put the name of the image, fo uh, image folder, slash, and then the file name. All right. Next time what we're going to do is we're going to start sort of a, a multiple lecture series where I talk about creating layouts with CSS. All right. Because we drew some wireframes and we made them laid out a certain way where maybe there's multiple columns or whatever. We've introduced CSS to you, but the study of how you use CSS to achieve a layout in the page is sort of a long and uh, is, is not a simple topic. So we'll sp spend several days in lecture talking about that. Are there any questions right now? All right. 
I will see you up in lab.